Well, good evening. Good to see everyone this evening. Thank you very much for your invitation and your welcome. Now, I'm going to be referring, God willing, to a number of scriptures as we go through this evening, but I'd just like to begin by reading a few verses from Luke's Gospel and chapter 24, the last chapter, please, of Luke's Gospel. Luke 24, the scene is the road to Emmaus on the first day of the week when the Lord Jesus rose from the dead and the two who were walking on the road to Emmaus, the stranger comes alongside them. We know the story so well and they tell him what has happened, how Jesus of Nazareth, who we hoped would, would be the one to deliver Israel, that he's died and those who went to the tomb this morning said that they'd seen angels and that he'd risen from the dead so they're obviously wondering at all of this but then the Lord speaks to them in verse 25 because of course it is he who is the stranger the Lord speaks to them in verse 25 of Luke 24 and says O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then the next verses tell how he went in to eat with them. They recognized him. He vanished from their sight and they hurried back to Jerusalem to find the 11 disciples and to tell them what has happened. Verse 35, they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And then after showing them his hands and his feet and speaking to them and eating with them, he then says in verse 44, he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. We leave the reading there for the moment and trust that God will bless his word to us this evening. So there in that passage in Luke 24, we find on two occasions on that resurrection day, that first Easter Sunday, the Lord Jesus Christ explains how the scriptures spoke of him. Now we opened with that lovely hymn, Oh, tell me more of Christ my Saviour. A really appropriate hymn for this evening because we are going to be looking at the scriptures and seeing what the scriptures have to tell us, just a little of what they have to tell us of Christ our Saviour. And when I refer to the scriptures, I'm referring to it in the same way as they would have referred to it in that conversation, which is the part of the Bible that we call the Old Testament, because that's the only part that they then had, of course, because none of the New Testament was written at that point in time. So it was the Jewish scriptures, the Jewish Bible, and in the second reference that we read, verse 44, the Lord refers to the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. On the road to Emmaus, there's a slightly shorter description beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So we've got the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. A little digression first before we go further, a little recap really on the, the three divisions of the Jewish Bible. Those were the three divisions. The law is the first five books, the Pentateuch, Genesis through to Deuteronomy, the books of Moses. The prophets, as far as the Jews were concerned, included the books that we call the history books, the historical books, so Joshua, Judges, and Samuel and Kings, and so on. 
and those were called the early prophets, the history books. And then the ones that we actually call the prophets from Isaiah onward, they call those the later prophets. And of course, in those earlier books, we read of the ministry of various prophets, particularly people like Elijah and Elisha. And in the later books where uh, it was getting towards the captivity or beyond or during or beyond the captivity, we're reading of the decline in Israel, the captivity and the restoration after the captivity. So uh, we've got the law, the first five books. We've got the prophets, which is the historical books as we see them and the prophetic books as we see them. And then the Psalms was the third division in verse 44. And that was a shorthand version. The Jews would call the other books the writings. And the Psalms was the biggest part of that third division. So it was often referred to just as the Psalms. But that division, the writings, included uh, books like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon. Also, I think Ruth and Esther were in that category and, and also Daniel for some reason. So there were various other books that were lumped together as the writings. But when the Lord Jesus, the point I want to make is this, when the Lord Jesus refers in verse 44 to the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, he is encompassing the whole Jewish Bible, the whole of what we now call the Old Testament. And he says, all of that wrote about me. It wrote about me. And uh, he's saying much the same thing back in verse 27 to the two on the road to Emmaus. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. It's all about me. He's saying it all points to me. There's a similar reference in Acts 8. Remember Philip uh, meeting the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian was reading from Isaiah chapter 53. It may not have been chapter 53 in his days. They may not have had those chapter divisions, but that's the passage he was reading, the one we know as Isaiah 53. And you remember, of course, what uh, it says that Philip did. He began at the same scripture and he preached unto him Jesus. He began at that scripture, but he didn't end with that scripture. He didn't stop at that scripture, just as the Lord on the road to Emmaus didn't stop in any one point. He began at Moses and all the prophets and expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So wherever we look in the Old Testament, we will find it pointing us to the Lord Jesus Christ. It will tell us more of Christ our Saviour as our hymn said at the beginning. It'll tell us more of Christ our Saviour. And where it says in Acts 8 that Philip preached unto him Jesus, the word preached is the word we'd use for preaching the gospel. It's the same root as the word evangelism or evangel, the gospel, the good news. He preached to him the good news about Jesus. So in the Old Testament, Although the gospel is explained more fully in the New Testament and we come to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John at the beginning of the New Testament, which are the gospels, the gospel doesn't start there. No, it's there in the Old Testament as well, looking forward, predicting, prophesying, pointing to the one who should come. Now, when we look into the Old Testament, we find prophecies which are direct, and by that I mean that they have one clear fulfillment. We find those which are indirect, I mean, it's my term, but, but what I mean by that is that there's maybe a short-term fulfillment, the direct fulfillment, but then a longer term, other fulfillment. So we see prophecies sometimes, you know, David speaking in the Psalms will speak of experiences that he has had or which he is going to have but there's a second layer of meaning to those prophecies and he is speaking of Christ as well. So when David opens Psalm 22 saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I am sure that he was going through a time of great personal turmoil and trial. But also, although he may not have realized it when he uttered those words and penned them, also, that psalm is pointing forward to that greater suffering that would be undertaken by great David's greater son. 
and some, some of the verses in that psalm, some of the verses in the Isaiah 53 passages, many of which are quoted when the Lord is on the cross. Some of them we can see might have had a direct primary fulfillment at the time, but some of them just go above and beyond anything that could have happened at the time and are purely messianic. We also in the Old Testament have pictures, types, shadows, which give us illustrations of what is going to happen. And we have what I like to call threads, which run through the scripture, a theme or a thread that starts early in the Old Testament and runs right through. And you see in the New Testament how it all works out and how it all comes together. So I'd like us to um, pick up just a few thoughts from the Old Testament. Now the Lord began at Moses and all the prophets and Philip began in Isaiah 53. I thought I'd begin at the beginning and uh, go to the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis, and just pick up a few points from the book of Genesis and remind us of how they point us forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. And three, three points I was gonna pick up were one, the creation, two, the fall, and three, the plan of redemption. And then maybe pick up a couple of specific passages as well after that. So the creation, let's go back to the creation. Right at the beginning, Genesis chapter one, Genesis chapter two. And when you go back to Genesis chapter one, and we won't read all of these passages this evening for the sake of time, and I'm sure that you know um, these passages pretty well anyway. When you read through Genesis chapter one, there's a phrase or phrases that you see repeated time and time again. God said, God said, let there be light. God said, God said, God said. And then you see God called as God names the various parts of his creation and the aspects of his creation. God said, God called throughout the chapter. It's the spoken word of God, which brings creation into being. We have here in the scripture the written word of God. Back at the time of creation, none of it had been written down, of course, but those who have been inspired by God to pen the different books of scripture have heard the spoken word of God and have written it down to give us the written word of God. So it was by the spoken word of God, the spoken decree of God, that creation was brought into being. And Psalm 33 makes that very clear. Verse 6 of Psalm 33 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. And then when you come into verse 9, it says, He spake and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. So it's very clear, isn't it? He spoke, and it was done. It was by the word of the Lord that the heavens were made. So creation comes through the spoken word of God. But when we come to another chapter one, and this is John chapter one in the New Testament, we're given a bit more, a bit more detail. Because John chapter 1 tells us how, in addition to the spoken word or the decree of God, creation was brought about by the Logos, the word, the living, personal word of God, the eternal Son, the eternal Son of God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And it goes on to tell us, doesn't it, how without him not anything was made that was made. What that verse, verse 3, I think it is, is saying is that nothing that ever came to be came to be without him. Anything that came to be came to be only through the living word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who gave existence to everything and every body that exists. And that's why it goes on to say, he was before all things, and by him all things consist. All things have their existence only through 
Christ. So, when having read John chapter 1, we go back to Genesis chapter 1 and we read, God said. We see in that phrase, not just the spoken word of God, but the living word, the eternal son, active in creation. That's what John chapter 1 tells us. So when we read God said in Genesis 1, we think of Christ because he is the living word of God through whom everything was created. And when we read in Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, we see in those words, not just the spoken word, but the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's there in creation, there in Genesis chapter 1, right through it, right through it. But we need John to explain it to us so that we can see him there, we can hear him there the living word of God there in creation. And of course, in verse 2 of Genesis 1, we have the Spirit as well. So we have the, the, the triune God taking part in creation. God, the Word, and the Spirit, all involved in creation. And so it's quite appropriate, actually, that before we get to the end of the first chapter of the Bible... In verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1, we have the first specific hint of what we come to call the doctrine of the Trinity. Trinity, a word that doesn't appear in Scripture, but the truth behind that doctrine runs right through the Scripture, starting in Genesis chapter 1, actually, because there in Genesis 1 and verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our image. We have the triune God acting in unity in one purpose, to make a creature that will be in the image of God. Now, I understand, point of detail here, but I understand that in the Hebrew language, there are three levels of number. We have two levels of number in English and in most other languages. That is singular and plural. Singular is one, plural is more than one. It could be two or it could be any number above two. But in the Hebrew language, they have three levels of number. They have singular, they have dual, and they have plural. So singular is one, dual is two, as the name suggests, and their plural is three or more. That is always more than two. And the form of wording used in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image, the us and the our, they are plural. That is, they are three. Not one and not two, but three. Three. So we have that truth of the Trinity, although it's unfolded for us much later in the Bible and we need to come to the New Testament to, to gain a fuller understanding of it, but we have it there in Genesis 1. Also, of course, in Genesis 3, the man has become as one of us. Genesis 11, let us go down the Tower of Babel. Isaiah chapter 6, whom shall I send, says God, who will go for us, for us, at the commissioning of Isaiah the prophet. And we see... The, in the first, in the creation account as well, not only the Lord Jesus Christ, but also a picture of, of the bride that he is seeking. Because the first two chapters of the Bible tell us about a bride created especially for Adam, the first man. And the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 20 and 21, bring before us the bride of the Lamb, a new creation for the one who is the second man and the last Adam. And that picture of marriage runs right through Scripture from beginning to end. Even the first miracle that the Lord carried out, of course, was at a marriage in Cana of Galilee. So in the creation account, we see the living word engaged in creation. And we see that picture of the bride that the Lord Jesus Christ is seeking, the church being the fulfillment of of that picture, you and me being privileged to be part of that bride of Christ. But of course, as we know, we go into chapter 3 of Genesis and the problems all start. Sin comes in 
to humanity. And uh, we, we, we know very well the story of the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. How is the problem of sin to be resolved? Well, we see a picture in the clothing that was made for the man and the woman by God. An animal had to die so that their shame could be covered. They thought that they could cover their shame, taking the, the leaves of fig trees. But God says, no, an animal had to die, and he clothed them with animal skins. So it's a picture that sacrifice is necessary for sin to be dealt with. We see the same picture, don't we, in the different offerings brought by Cain and Abel. Cain bringing of the fruit of the ground, Abel bringing um, an animal from the flock, a sacrifice uh, as an offering to God. So we see uh, a clear picture there pointing us forward to a sacrifice, and it's the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ ultimately, uh, as we know, that, um, that was necessary. But the very clearest early indication of how sin would be dealt with, we see in the words of God to the serpent. In Genesis 3 and verse 15, the seed of the woman shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. A clear reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman. Meaning, one, the person that will deal that mortal blow to Satan will be a human being. The seed of the woman, Eve, who is the mother of all living. I wonder also if we see another reference in that phrase, the seed of the woman, to the unique nature of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, born of a woman who was a virgin without the intervention of a man. The seed of the woman, he truly was uh, and is the seed of the woman. And the, the picture is, isn't it, obviously, of, of someone stamping on the head of a serpent. The seed of the woman shall bruise thy head dealing a mortal blow to the snake by stamping on his head. But in doing so, being injured, thou shalt bruise his heel, as if the snake, seeing that foot coming down to deal him a mortal blow, strikes out at the heel that is just going to, to, to stamp upon him. Thou shalt bruise his heel, indicating that the one who was the seed of the woman, the Lord Jesus, would himself be grievously hurt in dealing that mortal blow to Satan. And we can see it in a very literal sense, of course. His, wound, his heel would literally have been wounded by the nails that held him to the cross. So we can see it figuratively and literally as the Lord Jesus goes to the cross in order to deal that mortal blow to Satan and to destroy his power. And the plan of redemption, so God is telling um, Satan and, and, th and through the, the scripture telling all of us how that plan of redemption was going to come to pass through the seed of the woman. And the rest of the book of Genesis actually takes forward the story of the seed. That's a lovely study on its own really, but um, we won't have time to, to go much into that this evening. But we can see the way in which Satan attacks the line that came from the woman. No doubt um, influencing Cain to kill Abel. And I wonder if Satan then thought, where's God's plan now? Where's God's plan now? There were two sons, one's dead and one's a murderer. Where's God's plan now? But of course, then uh, Seth was born and his name means appointed and uh, Eve said God has appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew and so the seed continued the line that was to produce the seed of the woman continued and God preserved that line I remember um, forgive me if you heard this before but uh, Jeffrey Harrison once when he was preaching saying when I was young and a bit more arrogant I used to say I could preach the gospel from any verse in the Bible give me any verse and I'll preach the gospel from it so he said someone said how about 1 Chronicles chapter 1 and verse 1 and that verse just has three words in it. it's the beginning of the first genealogy it's Adam 
Seth, Enosh. Preach the gospel from that, they said. And Jeffrey Harrison said, oh, that's easy. Adam, the fallen man. Seth, the man appointed. Enosh, in the days of Enosh, men began to call upon the name of the Lord, says the book of Genesis. So you've got the fall, you've got the man appointed by God, and whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But Jeffrey Harrison did go on to say, I'm really glad he didn't give me verse 2, because I'd have struggled with that one. But verse 1, um, gospel in a nutshell. And we see that theme of the seed going through the rest of the book of Genesis. So it's the line of Seth is the chosen line after Abel has been killed by Cain. And then we see God choosing Noah and creation is preserved through the um, agency of Noah building the ark and taking his family and the animals onto the ark at the time of the flood. And then the descent from Noah through Shem, we come down to Abraham, whom God calls and to, to whom God makes those precious promises. And then coming from Abraham, we see God's sovereignty, choosing Isaac rather than Ishmael. And then of the sons of Isaac, choosing Jacob rather than Esau. And then of the sons of Jacob, all of those sons, choosing Judah as the one through whom the line would continue. Not Joseph, the most prominent, the favored son, the one of whom much of Genesis tells us the story, but Judah. Um, and that prophecy at the, uh, of Jacob in uh, Genesis 49 and 10, telling us the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So we see that line, that theme, that thread running through the book of Genesis. And it continues to run through the Old Testament. Um, Ruth is, is, a, is a lovely book picking up that theme. It takes us from um, the, uh, the sons of Judah uh, on to uh, the line of David. So it's bridging the gap, if you like, between Genesis and the time of David, and then points us forward to the New Testament where the New Testament begins. It's no accident that the New Testament begins. Matthew 1 and verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. A descendant from Abraham, a descendant from David. That's important, as some of you have heard me say on, on another topic uh, elsewhere. So that line of the seed that goes down through Jacob, Judah, on to David and on to the Lord Jesus Christ is a theme that runs right through the Old Testament and then comes back up in the New Testament. And that's why um, in the early part of the, the Gospels, the fact that though we're, we're in Matthew and Luke particularly where we read of the birth of the Lord Jesus, the fact that he was descended from David is such an important point in those birth stories. That's why it's important in our Christmas carols, once in royal David's city, to you in David's town this day is born of David's line. That's important because it showed that the Lord Jesus was born of the seed of David, um, who was in turn of the seed of Abraham, who was in turn of the seed of the woman. We see that line going right through the scripture. Um, so that's a quick run through, but that's a subject really that you can look at on its own. The seed of the woman, a lovely, a lovely study, and I would commend that to you. But in the time that's left to us, I'd like to think of, of two incidents in the book of Genesis that point us forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. Two specific incidents. And the first is the story of Melchizedek in Genesis and chapter 14. Now, we don't read a lot about Melchizedek in the scripture. We read about him here in Genesis 14, just a few verses. We're told very little about him, really. And then there's a reference to him in Psalm 110, which, you, you know, you might just read over that and think, where's that reference come from? Um, and then we read an explanation in the book of Hebrews. And without the explanation in the book of Hebrews, we might struggle, I think, to, uh, to piece the rest of it together. But it's a lovely picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the story in Genesis 14 is that certain kings have come from Mesopotamia, 
which was it, where Abraham had originally come from, of course, that, that region of Mesopotamia, the great ancient civilization that was later Babylon, present-day Iraq, that sort of area. And Abraham had come from there a number of years before and had reached the land of Israel, the land that would later be called Israel, having, led, having been led there by God. And he separated from Lot. Lot had made the wrong choice, had chosen to go to the plains near the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and ended up in the city of Sodom. Um, and, um, and Abraham uh, had a journey to the hill country. And in chapter 14, we read of certain kings that had invaded this region. They'd come from Mesopotamia and they had taken Lot and others and his men captive and had, had journeyed on the way back. And Abraham takes his men, his servants, and follows after them and uh, battles against them and brings back Lot and Lot's servant and his family and their goods and is met as he's coming back by Melchizedek, verse 18 of Genesis 14. Melchizedek, king of of Salem. We have just a couple of verses here as this Melchizedek meets Abraham. Now, the Hebrew epistle, chapters 6 and 7, explains a little more about Melchizedek. It says, without beginning of days, without end of life. Does that mean Melchizedek was eternal? I don't think so. I think what the writer to the Hebrews is saying is, Melchizedek's birth and death are not recorded. His early life and his later life are not recorded. They're unknown to us. But we just have this incident that's brought before us and we're told a few things about him. But in that there's no birth recorded and no death recorded, he's a picture of the eternal Son of God. There are some commentators who believe Melchizedek was a manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wouldn't dogmatically disagree. I, I don't see it that way myself. Um, I would see him as an ordinary man who was a picture of the Lord Jesus, but I wouldn't get um, dogmatic about it. But clearly, the writer to the Hebrews is saying he is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. His name, Melchizedek, means King of Righteousness. And Genesis tells us he was king of Salem. Salem was thought to be the region where Jerusalem was later built, Jerusalem. Some of us remember singing the hymn, when mothers of Salem their children brought to Jesus. So Melchizedek was a king in that small area, in the place that would later become Jerusalem. But as the writer to the Hebrews points out, the word Salem means peace, the same root as the Hebrew word Shalom. So this man Melchizedek was king of righteousness and king of peace. What better picture could we have of our Lord Jesus Christ than someone who is king of righteousness and king of peace? Bringing together those two qualities, grace and truth, came by Jesus Christ. It's not possible for you and me to attain perfect righteousness and perfect peace or grace. Well, we know that because of our sin it's not possible for us to attain perfect righteousness, but even if it were, even if it were, we would find we couldn't then be at peace with other people because they wouldn't be perfect. And how can you have peace between something that is perfect and something that is imperfect. God solved that problem through Christ and his death because he made peace through the blood of his cross. His death has made peace because in his death he paid the price for sin. So righteousness is not compromised and God can reach out to you and me and bring us to himself without compromising his righteousness because our sin has been paid for and he can enjoy perfect peace with you and me if we come to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what it means when it says in John 1, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And 
That's why he is ultimately and eternally king of righteousness and king of peace, as we see pictured in this man, Melchizedek. Psalm, I think it's 85, um, also points forward to that as a lovely verse saying, Righteousness, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other or have embraced. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Psalm 85 and verse 10. Looking forward, I think, to the one, the person who would achieve that, who would bring righteousness and peace together. So, Melchizedek is a picture of the Lord Jesus in that sense. He's also a picture of the Lord Jesus in the sense that he was both a king and a priest. Not possible in Judaism because the king had to be of the tribe of Judah and the priest of the tribe of Levi. They couldn't be the same person. And when Uzziah the king thought that he could do a priestly function, he paid the price for it, as you'll know from the story of Uzziah. But um, the Hebrew epistle tells us, repeating from Psalm 110, which tells us that the Messiah is declared to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Not the order of Aaron, but the order of Melchizedek. So he is both king and priest in the same person. And the Hebrew epistle explains why the Melchizedek priesthood is greater, is better in this sense than the priesthood of the line of Aaron. And then let's think again about where this took place. Genesis 14 tells us that Melchizedek, king of Salem, it's verse 18, brought forth bread and wine. When Abraham came back, needing refreshment, Melchizedek gave him bread and wine. Bread and wine. And thousands of years later, in the same place, basically, where Melchizedek, gave bread and wine to Abraham, who was called the friend of God. Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of peace, gives bread and wine to the friend of God. And many centuries later, the one who is eternally king of righteousness and king of peace, on the night that he was going to be betrayed, gave bread and wine to those whom he called his friends. In that last supper, he handed round the bread and then the wine and said, do this in remembrance of me. We see that prefigured so many centuries before in the life of Melchizedek. I said two incidents and very quickly before we close, the second one, one that you know very well and one that I think I touched on a few years ago when I was speaking at Easter in Llanelli, but um, we, we'll just pick up a couple of these points again. It's Genesis chapter 22. It's the offering of Isaac by his father Abraham when God tested Abraham and said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. The land of Moriah. That actually is the same place where Abraham met Melchizedek because it's the region of Jerusalem. And we know that because 2 Chronicles 3 and verse 1 tells us where Solomon was going to build the first temple on a plot of ground that David had bought from Ornan the Jebusite Jabus being the old name of Jerusalem, so the Jebusites inhabited Jerusalem, and we're told it was in the land of Moriah, the land of Moriah. So that's where Jerusalem was, the land of Moriah. So Abraham was sent to the place which would later on be Jerusalem. Jerusalem built on several hills. Go to a hill in the land of Moriah, said God, a mountain that I will tell you of. So, in the region of Jerusalem, a loving father is willing to offer his son. They walk up the, the hill together, and Isaac, the son of promise, is bearing 
on his back the wood on which his body is going to be offered. And centuries later, on those same hills in the land of Moriah, the eternal son of promise walked its streets and he was bearing upon his back until he was too weak to do so any longer. He was bearing upon his back the wood on which his body was going to be offered as a sacrifice. This time crucifixion rather than a burnt offering, but a burnt offering in every figurative sense of the word, certainly. Just a wonderful picture, isn't it? But there was unity between the Father and the Son. Genesis 22 tells us, and it repeats it twice, verse 6 and verse 8, they went both of them together. They went both of them together. There was no disunity. There was no resistance on the part of Isaac. They went together. And the Lord Jesus went willingly to the cross. He said as he went out from the upper room the night before, to go to Gethsemane and on to the trials and then to Calvary, he said, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Arise, let us go hence. They went, both of them, together. Where's the lamb, said Isaac to his father for a burnt offering. We've got the wood and we've got the fire, but where's the lamb? The answer, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Two fulfillments to that, of course, because God provided the ram, although Abraham didn't realize that he would have that quick a fulfillment of what he said. But, of course, much later on, God provided the Lamb of God for the offering that would put away sin once and for all. But, of course, as you know, That offering of Isaac on the mountain was a picture of resurrection as well as a picture of death. The Hebrew epistle explains that. It tells us of the faith of Abraham who accounted that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead. And I'm glad we've got that explanation from the writer to the Hebrews, um, inspired by God. But actually, when you read Genesis 22 carefully, you can see it there. Because as they left the servants to go up the mountain, it was only Abraham and Isaac who went up the mountain. As they left the servants, Abraham says to them, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. We'll both go and we'll both come back. How's that, Abraham? Did he not mean to kill Isaac? Well, he certainly did intend to. He raised the knife in his hand and it was only the voice of God from heaven that withheld the knife. So how did he expect to come back? As the writer to the Hebrews says, he expected that God would raise Isaac from the dead. It's a picture of resurrection as well as of death. He received him in like figure, the writer to the Hebrews says. It's a picture of resurrection. And Abraham had worked this out. He'd thought, well, God has promised that the seed will continue through Isaac and I'll have a great nation through Isaac. But God has asked me to kill Isaac. God will not break his promise. Therefore, if God asks me to kill Isaac, God will raise him from the dead and fulfill his promise. That was Abraham's logic. He didn't realize that God would withhold his hand, but uh, his faith in God's word was absolutely sure. And of course, um, as you'll have noticed, there's a a picture of resurrection even in the timing because as they journeyed after God had told Abraham to go, verse 4 of Genesis 22 says, On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. On the third day. What's the day of resurrection? It's the third day. The third day, he rose from the dead on the third day. So we see in Genesis 22 that wonderful picture of God giving his son. The only difference, of course, and it's it's such an enormous difference, is that there was a substitute for Isaac, the ram caught in the thicket. 
But there was no substitute for God's son because he was our substitute. And that's why he went there to the cross. We'll leave it there. Our time has gone. But I hope that this brief look through some of the those, those scriptures in the book of Genesis, and I know they're all well-known scriptures, but hopefully it's reminded us how the words of the Lord Jesus are so true. All the scriptures, they speak of me. He expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Let's be encouraged to read our Old Testaments and to see the Lord Jesus Christ in those Old Testament scriptures making our prayer the words of our opening hymn, Tell Me More of Christ, my Saviour. Shall we pray together? God, our Father, we do give thanks 